Thanks, Ben. Thanks, MAS. This has been a, and continues to be, a uh, provocative two-day conference, provocative in the very best sense. And uh, a lot of ideas flying around here, very important, and I applaud Vince Apola, MAS, its chair, and everyone associated with this conference for putting it together. I'm learning a lot, I'm thinking a lot, and uh, I expect everyone in this room is. And uh, my brief introduction here is to the next keynote speaker who will talk about the Greening New York City's Historic Buildings, a Green Row House Manual. Very important, incredibly uh, thoughtful, very instructive, important for er many people in this room to be using on a day-to-day -day basis going forward. And we partnered the Landmarks Commission. Gori Harala did Yeoman's work on this with uh, the staff of the Municipal Arts Society in putting this together, and um, it targets in a sense, its most its focus right now is on small historic buildings, the classic row houses. There are thousands of them in New York that are under the protection of the Landmarks Commission. They're constantly changing, being upgraded, restored, preserved, and um, let's make that green. I have always said that the, it's obvious that the greenest building is one that you leave in place, as Hugh Hardy and I just discussed, or you don't demolish, and you start from there. But as you are making changes, as you are restoring, as, it, as you are adaptively reusing buildings, uh, we think it ought to be, and everybody I think would agree, that it can be done uh, at the same time to help reduce the city's greenhouse gas emissions and without impacting the fundamental architectural character of the buildings. Uh, this is all part of the mayor's, Mayor Bloomberg's incredibly broad and sweeping and successful Plan NYC, and Dan Doctoroff led that uh, when he was still in government, a colleague of mine who's coming up next, and that has achieved tremendous results. And this is a small piece of it, a sm small but impactful, I believe. So MAS began the project because they were concerned, and we shared that concern, the misconception about historic preservation and sustainability. Are they in conflict? Probably not. Intuitively, you think they're not. And we think that this manual provides guidance to, to prove it, that basically they work hand in hand, they're compatible, it provides guidance for making green improvements while still following best practices for historic preservation. And at the LPC, our green, we have a green team, so-called, at the LPC that is constantly looking and exploring ways that preservation and sustainability goals can uh, interact and intersect. So we think, again, not to be overly repetitive, but the green interventions can be made to historic buildings that are totally consistent with the landmarks law. And many of the ideas in this manual, uh, just to prove that it's not an academic exercise, and I think when you look at it, you'll, you'll know it isn't, but just to make sure that that was the case, that it's been pilot tested, if you will, at the Henry Street Settlement, a significant New York City landmark, and that project proved that the modest investments that they made in uh, improving their buildings led to significant, definable, provable uh, increases in energy efficiency. So the real nitty gritty of this comes in, in a very short, in a moment, and, and he won't have a whole lot of time to, to talk about it, but uh, the architect Chris Garvin from Cook and Fox and the environmental consulting team of Terrapin Bright Green. Chris and his team at Terrapin were chosen based on their vast experience in greening historic buildings. He can talk about this in a little more detail than I have. We're just very pleased to have this as a tangible result uh, going in, leading into this conference and everything else going on at this conference, this summit is uh, equally enlightening, in my opinion. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Chris? Thank you, Bob. I'd like to thank MAS and the Landmarks Commission for uh, being our partners on this project and, and, and working with us on it. Very proud of the work we've done. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about it today. Um, can I get my first slide, please? Great. So uh, if you're not in the, the historic preservation or the environmental uh, sustainability world, um, I just want to give you a pers perspective on these two sister uh, perspectives on the environment. These are my nieces, actually, and I think they're a great metaphor 
for these two groups. Um, they both grew up on the belief that the city is important, and that uh, the seats to the streetscape and the existing buildings that we live and uh, work in are powerful and shape our lives. Um, they both want to protect it and also maintain the vitality of the city um, for years to come. But they don't always agree, as, as sisters don't. And this manual is part about trying to find that common ground and amplifying it. And so, you know, for owners, this is a huge challenge. Um, it's expensive to own property in New York City, and preserving a beautiful historic row house um, is an honor that owners take and they pass on to future owners. But at the same time, we have to change the way these buildings are operated to adapt to our lives now and into the future. I think that's where sustainability really comes in with preservation to create a unique opportunity. And so the manuals that we've created really uh, are guidelines and create, you know, address the issues that owners will face and provide opportunities and strategies to help them uh, uh, renovate and restore these homes in the best way possible. And to understand these small historic buildings are about, they're about 580,000 in New York City in all five boroughs. They account for over 50% of the building stock and given that our building stock is 80% of our greenhouse gas emissions, they're critical in addressing climate change. And these buildings are going to be here in the next 50, for the next 50 years. And so we have to address them. It's, a, it's a high on the agenda of the Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability. And these manuals are part of the, the approach to help um, improve them. And it's important because if we don't improve them or reduce their energy consumption, make them more sustainable, we're just going to exacerbate the existing uh, climate change problems we have now and that we see projected into the future as temperatures continue to rise in this region. So what's great about historic buildings in, in, the, in the sustainability context is that you know, we are, they, they exist and, so they're, and they're built of very durable materials. Um, mo many of them were built, or almost all of them were built before air conditioning, uh, electricity in some cases, and they were designed with all these passive features that we can harness as we restore them uh, back to their, in, into a more historic manner. And this helps reduce uh, construction demolition waste, which, which is 60% of the city's waste stream. Oh, can you go back one, please? Uh, okay. Um, sorry. So the, our waste stream is, uh, about 60% of our waste stream is construction demolition waste. About 10 million tons of waste a year comes from the just demolition and the renovation of buildings in the city. And so preserving existing buildings reduces that in an, in, a, in an amazing way for the city, and we have to continue along that trajectory. And the manual is try, it tries to address the, the widest range of uh, changes and strategies for owners. So everything from repair and replace, which in some ways is the best strategy for preservation instead of uh, re uh, completely a major renovation, and this uh, allows for the retention of beautiful historic details. It also reduces the, uh, the demolition, sorry, yeah, um, the demolition that occurs in the waste stream um, that I mentioned earlier. But that's not always possible. Unfortunately, some buildings are in, di are in great disrepair or they need to be uh, adaptively reused to new uses that require extensive renovation. And for that level of concern, we have also look at a, a wide range of strategies that look at when you're replacing entire electrical systems and mechanical systems, or um, actually even perhaps even parts of the envelope, how can you do that in a manner that improves the sustainability while maintaining the historic character of both the building but also the neighborhood? And I think a great example of that is this house on uh, Sydney Place. This townhouse was built in 1846. And last year, it became one of the first passive house standard certified homes in New York City, which uses 90% less energy than a standard townhouse. 
And if you can think about what would that mean, what would that mean if those 580,000 historic buildings all reduce their energy consumption by 90%. And I think that's the type of vision we have to have both to protect these buildings, but also to maintain the vitality and the sustainability that we hope for the future of this city. And I think when we get there, we get preservation and, his, and sustainability working together in a way that only adds greater value to the city of New York. And um, as Bob mentioned, this is the row house manual. And by the end of the year, we hope we will have um, a commercial institutional manual for small historic, uh, historic buildings, uh, single family homes for the outer boroughs that are historic, and um, uh, co-op and condos for the city. So look, take a look, look, look out for those. But uh, for now, on the MES website, you can download the PDF for the row house manual. Thank you.